Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. So yeah, I'm super happy to be back on stage after all these years without conferences. It's super nice to be able to present again. And uh, so yeah, so um, as Pierre David said, uh, I'm currently a software engineer working on randomness. Uh, I used to be an applied cryptographer looking at other software engineers' code and having nightmare about what I saw. You know, so I'm here to make it sure to make sure that you won't do the same mistakes when it comes to randomness as what I saw in the past. And I'm also super happy to um, play the CTF tomorrow, uh, I, well, tonight already. And uh, yeah, let's start. So today we'll discuss about what is randomness and its different flavors. Uh, ne next we'll go, uh, we'll, we'll talk about why do we even need randomness, uh, when do we use it, why, and so on. Um, we'll see what are the problems with randomness and why it's hard. And finally, we'll see how we do good randomness in practice and what remains to be done. So what is randomness? If you look up in the dictionary, <laughs> that's a quality of being random. Great. They go on and refine a bit saying, so that the quality of being random, happening, done, or chosen by chance rather than according to a plan. That's not exactly how we see randomness in computer sciences, right? So I found another dictionary which has a bit of a better definition. So randomness is the quality or state of lacking a pattern. And here there is a very important word. It's, it says unpredictability. And we'll see why it's very important later on. So here I've picked a few random strings, binary strings, um, 37 bits. Who can tell me if the first one is random? Doesn't look random, right? So how about the second one? Is it random? Ah, probably. Um, the third one doesn't look random neither, right? So probably not random. The fourth one looks random, but if you look at the hexadecimal representation, it doesn't look random anymore. And the last one also definitely doesn't look random. So what that means is that even though all of these 37-bit random strings have the same probability of being drawn at random, we have some kind of intuition of what's random and what's not. Right? So we'll see what that intuition actually means uh, right now. And when we talk about randomness, we have a way to formalize it a bit. We use the Kolmogorov complexity to look at randomness and say, oh, that looks random, or oh, that doesn't look random. And the Kolmogorov complexity of a string is basically a way to see if you can compress it, you know? How much can you compress the all one binary string? Well, a lot, because it's only ones. So you just say, oh, it's 37 times one, and you've compressed it. Uh, on the other hand, if you've got a truly random value, it's way more difficult to compress uh, in a general manner. So that's the intuition we have about randomness. And um, it's going to, yeah, that's also why we want about randomness, right? The, um, being able to not easily guess what's next and so on. And we'll see what unpredictability and bias are later on. So next is the, you know, my talk is about public, verifiable, distributed randomness. And you might be asking yourself, what are all those keywords, right? So public randomness is basically just a value that is random, but that is that is meant to be public. Like, think of lotteries. If you, you know, buy a ticket, you choose your numbers, at some point they will draw the winning ticket by drawing a random value, and that random value is public. Anybody can look it up and see, oh, that's the winning number for today's lottery. And um, that's really what public randomness is about. It's 
something you want everybody to be able to access and use for their own needs, whatever it is, be it for, I don't know, like a lottery, a uh, game, like if you want to have uh, some kind of gambling and so on. And um, next, we'll make the difference between public and secret randomness, because public randomness is cool, but I guess you've all YubiKeys, SSH keys, PGP keys on your computers, right? And these are secret keys that are not meant to be public. So if you take a public value, a public random value, and use that value to produce your secret key, mm, that's not going to work well. So we also have the notion of secret randomness that is meant to stay secret. And that's typically the one we'll use for cryptography stuff, like generating key material, nonces, so numbers that are meant to be used only once, uh, and so on. So it's super important to keep that in mind. Do not, never, use public randomness to generate secret keys. Seems obvious, right? So next, public randomness is cool, but how do you know it's actually random, right? We've seen earlier it's very difficult to have an intuition of what's random and what's not. And even though we have one, we might have some doubts about, you know, like the honesty of the person in front of us. Like if you create a tombola game and you give tickets to everybody, and then one of your good friends win the tombola, people might be like, hey, you cheated. So that's not something you typically want when you do something public, like uh, on a blockchain, typically you have smart contracts which need random values, or um, in the lottery uh, ecosystem, and for other use cases as well. So what we need next is a way to verify the randomness. And Verifiable randomness is just that. It's a, run, it's a public random value that's, that you can verify somehow. Um, that's typically done using hashes, signatures, or complex cryptography, and uh, we'll touch on the ways to do it uh, when we'll see the uh, concrete instantiation uh, in the in-practice part of my talk. And finally, we got the distributed keyword uh, in the title. And distributed randomness is just like what you think it is when you hear it. It's a random value that was achieved, like that was created by a distributed system. And that distributed system needs to achieve consensus on the random value because otherwise it's not going to be a good distributed system if each node has different you know, values at the same time in point. And that's very difficult to do because you want your randomness to be unpredictable, but at the same time, you want all of your nodes in your network to be able to generate the same value at the same moment. So how do you make it so that it's you know, unpredictable, but still generated on time by all nodes? And that's, again, a very difficult task. And blockchain system have struggled with that. If you look at Ethereum, for example, smart contracts on Ethereum have a very hard uh, time trying to generate random values. And if you look at other uh, distributed systems, usually what you'll find is that you have some kind of trusted third party providing the randomness. And that's not too great because you need to trust somebody, and decentralization and distributed system usually try to decentralize trust, you know? So we don't want to trust a single third party about anything, even our random values. So that's going to be a short section, but why do we need randomness? Well, I spoke about lotteries and gambling already. These are like obvious uh, things. Uh, other things you could think of is like jury election or sortition. Uh, these are the kind of things where you really like need proper public randomness, probably, because you want it to be uh, publicly auditable, and so you want it to also be verifiable as well. Uh, next, you obviously have all the um, cryptographic protocols. If you connect to a website nowadays, your computer is probably generating between two and five random values just for the initial connection, you know, like generating ephemeral keys, nonces, and uh, that's a lot of secret randomness, obviously. Um, next, we have the obvious uh, um, case of 
statistics and control trials in medicine, if you can, you know, if you have a biased distribution when you pick your uh, sample, the results of your study won't be really good and it won't be, um, yeah, what you want it to be. So you need good randomness there as well without any bias. And uh, finally, we use it a lot in software in general. Like if you do fuzzing, uh, chaos monkey, and so on, you also want to take random values. But these values can be generated by some that by a PRNG, a pseudo-random number generator, that's going to be seeded in a way that's um, repeatable. So you, it can be deterministic. It doesn't need to be secret. It doesn't need to be public. But it still needs to be uniformly um, distributed in the well in the values you're uh, interested in. So next we'll look into what are the problems we have with randomness, because randomness seems easy, right? You just take a random value and you're done. So why is it a problem? And I've talked about this a lot already, but randomness is difficult because you want it to be unpredictable and bias resistant. Um, I mean, being unpredictable, it kind of obvious. If you can predict the next lottery ticket, you can win it. Or if you can predict the loot you'll get in the game, you, you can cheat and so on. So it, it makes sense, right? But the bias resistant thing is a bit less obvious. And actually, <laughs> for cryptographic uh, algorithms, it's super important. Because the most used signature scheme nowadays is probably ECDSA. It's used for TLS, it's used uh, on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a lot of new systems nowadays are running using elliptic curve cryptography. And signature schemes such as ECDSA are super sensitive to bias. Uh, you will typically get a, take a, um, at random a 256-bit value. Well, if you have just one bit that is biased or three bits, it's already a potential vulnerability that could leak your private key. So leaking the private key is the most catastrophic thing that can happen for a cryptographic system. You really don't want that to happen. So it's super important to have really unbiased random values for such cryptographic schemes. And I guess a lot of you have already developed something where you needed a random number, right? So how do you do that? If you want a number between 0 and 255, that's easy, right? You take a random byte, you can call uh, your block device urandom to get a random byte out of your machine entropy pool, and you get a value between 0 and 255. Now it gets trickier if you want a value between 0 and 106, right? How do you do that? Well, the typical way people will do that is taking a random byte, and then reducing it modulo the values I want to be the limit, right? So here, if I reduce it uh, modulo 107, I'm happy because every number up to 106 will, be, will stay the same, and then 107 will become 0, 108 will become 1, everything is mapped you know, onto the range you want to, to query from. But that's actually an issue. Because you don't have a multiple of 107 amongst two, the 256 possibilities you can get from a random byte. So what you've just done here is introducing a modulo bias. Because for the first 107, uh, 106 uh, values, that's fine. The next 106 values, it's fine again. But once you reach 214 up to 255, these are going to be mapped towards the first 42 first values. And so you get bias randomness. And it's super easy to get bias randomness because you just picked a random value, which was good. You reduced it modulo the value you wanted to reduce it to. And suddenly, it's not a good random value anymore. And this is leaking your private key already if you're signing stuff with a value that was generated in that way. And so the best way to avoid such bias is obviously to not uh, do it yourself and rely on your cryptographic library. Uh, Python has a secret module sign, since Python uh, 3.6. 
uh, Go and Rust have very good um, random generator uh, functions. But in general, if you need to do it yourself, what you want to do is rely on so-called rejection sampling, where you will pick a value at random, see if it's in the range you want. If it is, then you're fine. If not, you reject it and you pick a new one against at random. And that's going to be uniformly distributed and it's not going to be biased. And I've got a cool link to a guide to modulo bias and how to avoid it. It's a blog post I wrote like two or three years ago. And uh, if you want to check it out, I recommend you read it. So now we've seen this cool different kind of randomness. Let's see how we can solve the issue of public verifiable distributed randomness, right? So if we look a bit at the history of public random randomness, we can see that uh, Michael Rabin already proposed the use of random beacons, and that's where the beacon word comes from, in 1993 to secure transactions. Well, that was before Bitcoin and before blockchain, so these transactions are not the same as the transaction we might be looking at nowadays, but the, the base idea was the same as what we have now. And, and what he says in his paper is that it is impossible without a trusted third party. And that's something we are actually going to challenge in a bit. Next, we can see in 1998, a website such as random.org that offers a true random number generator anybody can use and they are getting their randomness from the atmospheric noise. Physical process, good entropy, everybody's happy, right? Well, how do you verify it was actually taken from atmospheric noise? You cannot, and uh, so you have to trust them. And usually you don't like trusting random people on the internet, right? So next we have NIST, which comes in 2011 and says, the internet needs a public, verifiable, trusted randomness beacon system. And it's funny because NIST is not the most trusted party out there, right? But they went ahead and they launched their first NIST beacon in 2013, and the NIST beacon is based on a secure hardware. So you have to trust the secure hardware NIST is using to produce the proper true randomness from quantum entanglements, which is a cool way of producing randomness. And then they publish it online with a signature. You can verify the signature and everything. That's, that's public verifiable randomness, except it's generated by a single trusted third party, which is not something we want, right? So when we look at previous attempts to generate public randomness, we can see none of them are really great. Um, there was a paper about using Bitcoin to try and do it, because why not? Nah, promising, but Bitcoin is super slow, and it relies on proof of work, which is not something we really like nowadays, right? So meh. Next. In 2016, another paper came out which had a super cool technique to do distributed randomness in a publicly verifiable way. So that sounds like the, the way to go, right? Except it was super slow and it was using Schnorr signatures, which are, yeah, it, it, it was doing a bunch of really nice things, but it was not so efficient. So the question we had was can we do it in a simpler and faster way? And that's how we came up with the answer that yes, we can. And so the internet needed a randomness service that is just like the NTP servers you use to get the time on your device, right? That is public, free, and available. And so we came up with the notion of DRAN, which stands for distributed randomness, which is a highly available, decentralized, and publicly verifiable source of, random of randomness. And we'll see how that works. So DRAN is an open source software. You can download it on GitHub. You can check it. You can review it. It was even audited, so, so far so good. Next, it is really meant to be run as a network of nodes. So you will have multiple nodes running the same software. Uh, I mean, you could re-implement it as well. There is a spec. But running the DRAN software, um, spec. 
And then what it does is basically it relies on distributed key generation, which is a cool way of using verifiable secret sharing and threshold cryptography to generate a key that no single node ever sees or gets in memory, but that every node in the network can agree is the right key. And then it will use BLS, so Benelin Shasham signature scheme on the BLS 12381 pairing curve to do signatures. And the funny thing with BLS signatures is that you can take any number of BLS signatures and you can aggregate them into a single signature. And so each node in the network is going to sign a value, and that sign value means nothing until you take them together, aggregate them, and get the aggregate signature, which can be verified to be coming from that group. And the nice thing is you only need a threshold of nodes. So if you have 20 nodes, you could say, OK, my threshold is 10. And you generate, during the distributed key generation, uh, a public key that will allow any 10 nodes to generate a valid signature for the group. So those are called group signatures. And we use the signature as a way to produce randomness, because a good signature cannot be distinguished from a random value. So that's a, a rule for cryptographic signatures. If you have a good uh, a signature scheme, you cannot distinguish a signature from a random value. So we take the group signature from the group of nodes, and that, that gives us a random value. And that random value is generated in a decentralized way, is unpredictable because it's indistinguishable from random. It's resistant to bias, and you can verify it was generated by that group of nodes since it's a signature. So, yay, we did it, right? Um, and we actually did it. So we launched in 2019 uh, the League of Entropy, which was a team of people who decided to run uh, DRAND on your servers, and you can try it out now on your browser. You just, or using curl, whatever. You can just see it running for two year, uh, three years now. And um, the League of Entropy was actually founded by Cloudflare, Kudelsky Security, Protocol Labs, a bunch of other companies which are running, you know, internet stuff. And it's really meant to provide you with public, verifiable randomness which is unbiased, which is uh, unpredictable, and that's highly available. And it's been running like that with these 16 members with 23 nodes on a threshold of 12. So it means half of the nodes can get offline and you would still get proper randomness produced. And it's been running like that oh, sorry, uh, since 2019 which is pretty cool, because it means we, we did it, right? And a nice thing is also Cloudflare has a set of lava lamps in their offices they could use as a true random generator to bring fresh entropy into the network. So we get all the benefits from, on one side, we get a set of nodes where we don't need to trust a single node. On the other side, we get some nodes which are providing fresh uh, true random values, like you, the University of Chile is also part of the network, and they use the uh, data from like seismic events in Chile to produce the randomness and so on. So that's that's pretty nice. And um, the nice thing also with DRAN is that it's supporting so-called multi-protocol support since very recently. We launched it last week, actually. And that means we can expand the network to do more things that we couldn't before. Like we could have a post-quantum algorithms running, we could have a faster network because the current tick is like every 30 seconds. So we could say, oh, let's do every five seconds. And um, this is ongoing. And um, the other nice thing about DRAN is also that it used to be chain randomness because we were looking at blockchain tech and all they did thing, and we decided it was pretty cool to be able to, you know, chain all the beacons together. 
And what we recently changed about DRAN is that instead of producing rounds that are linked to the previous round, which means it's super difficult to verify because you need a stateful system and look at the previous round, and it's a bit annoying, you know, we decided we could just get rid of the chains. And now we have like one round, which is signed, and the next round, which is signed, and they are independent, so you don't need the state anymore. And uh, why am I talking about unchained randomness, you might be asking, is because it's pretty interesting, because it enables us to do super cool things, such as time lock encryption. And that's something that's upcoming. Um, we're currently developing it, but it basically says you can encrypt something toward the future. So let's say I want to encrypt something which cannot be decrypted until I say, August, I could use the trust assumption that we have in the League of Entropy to produce proper randomness on time every 30 seconds until August. And thanks to the pairings and all the fun crypto we use behind the scene, we can encrypt data that you can decrypt once the network will produce a signature. So we are kind of using a signature as a secret key. Yeah, you heard me. But it actually works. And nobody can decrypt the data until the given time has arrived, as long as the network still runs, obviously. And uh, this is pretty cool, because it's something which was first it was an ID in the cypherpunk uh, mailing list that was submitted by Tim May, which is like the founder of this uh, cypherpunk movement and the like, crypto anarchists. And that has been unsolved for 30 years. And now we're bringing it live soon. And yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So obviously, it's cool to have a public <laughs> randomness uh, service, but we need people to use it. So I'm here to tell you it exists. We did it. We solved the issue of public, verifiable, distributed randomness. It's highly available. It's been running for three years without a single disruption. So yeah, if you have any kind of cool project where you need to do, I don't know, a lottery or you need public ran randomness, please use it. And I'm here to also answer your questions and help you with that if you, if you need. And finally, I know I'm talking to a lot of uh, security professionals. So you could go ahead and say, oh, we want to build our own public uh, network, which is running uh, next to yours. That's cool. Do it, please, by any means. But you could also say, hey, I want to join the cool League of Entropy thing because I got a server sitting in my house and I'm not using it, so please do as well. We were looking for new members. Um, it's not taking too much time to set up and then it, it runs. Um, so, yeah. And uh, with that, I'm done. So thank you very much for listening about uh, randomness and public randomness. And you can send the questions on Slido. Thank you.